So why didn't my CPA tell me about this awesome tax deduction? That's what we're going to talk about. Uh, we're not going to talk too much about why they didn't tell us, uh, but we'll see very clearly as we go on uh, why they didn't. I want to try to be mindful of the time. So Kavita, just to double check, we're about a quarter till uh, okay. right now. What, uh, how much time should we give this? You're muted yourself. Or? Uh, 30 minutes. Sorry, I've muted okay. myself. I don't <laughs> want to in the mic, so. <laughs> That's all right. Um, so yeah, my name is Yona Weiss. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I don't really need to do any more introduction. Let's just jump right into it. So we're going to, this is what we're going to talk about tonight. And I'll try to cover a lot more uh, in the interim. If you do have any questions throughout, please do not hesitate to ask them and to uh, write them in the, in the chat box. And if we don't get to them in the middle, like Kavita, if, if I'm not going to have time to really look at the chat box, but if you do while we're on here, Mm -hmm. Actually, I'll try to open it here. No, I'm not, I'm not even going to open it. No, don't worry about it. I'll monitor that for you. So okay. you if you see story. something that's like, you know, someone didn't understand what I said or something very specific to the page that we're on, great. If not, everyone should stay till the end. Write down your questions in the chat box. We will get to all of them at the end. Yeah. So we we're going to talk about... over, so you guys might have to hang in there. <laughs> <laughs> and I do tend to talk a little fast sometimes, so... Uh, it's a topic that I love and I'm very excited about and excited to share with you guys and especially taking this time out of your evening. So I do appreciate that. We're going to talk about depreciation. So that was my introduction of appreciation to you for all coming on, to me for having me. But depreciation, we're going to talk about cost segregation, cost saying what is it, what are the benefits, uh, who should be doing it, when should you be doing it, um, and then what are the ben uh, bonus depreciation with the new law. We're also going to talk about why you shouldn't do it or who shouldn't do it. And we will touch upon, you know, why didn't my CPA tell me about this? And then we'll do actual a case study. And that's going to be really fun because you'll see the real live numbers of how this actually works. And without further ado, oh, this is a disclaimer. Kavita already had one, but it's basically the same idea. You know, you have to make sure you're understanding this. Speak to your tax or legal counsel before you actually do anything because in the end of the day, everything is, should be taken with a grain of salt for educational purposes, not telling you what to do. Um, so depreciation, and this is something I want to clear up. Depreciation, the textbook definition of it means that something goes down in value. However, for cost segregation and for real estate purposes, depreciation is actually just a borrowed term. Borrowed term because property, unlike you know, equipment or, or things that you may be buying and they're going down in value. And, you know, you buy a printer and after five years, you got to buy a new printer because it's gone down in value. It doesn't work anymore. Real estate is actually appreciating. It's actually going up in value. However, the tax law states that you can write off the entire value of that property over 39 years for commercial property or 27 and a half years for residential property. And residential also includes multifamily. So even though multifamily is considered commercial for uh, loan purposes, for you know other purposes, it's considered res uh, residential for tax purposes, which means it's an added benefit. And I know a lot of people are in the multifamily space, which is one more reason why multifamily is uh, the best asset class. Um, so, well, at least according to many. So that means you're allowed to write off the entire value as if it's going down in value, okay? Now, there's a special technique, it's a strategy, what we're gonna talk about tonight called cost segregation. Literally the words mean we're segregating the costs. We are splitting up uh, the different components of the building into different asset lives, different, which depreciate on a faster life, a five year. Yona, we lost you. Hey, Yona, we lost you. Take that tax deduction, take that write off earlier on. Um, so let's just give a quick overview of what is depreciation, how it works. When you buy a building for a million dollars, okay, let's say you buy a property for a million dollars, and we're always going to have to allocate a certain amount of land. Land does not depreciate. 
Okay, so we're going to be left with an $850,000 basis. Now, I use 15% because it's a pretty average number. Nationally, there are certain places in the country uh, where it will be a higher number, and certain places where it's going to be lower. So that's just an average number just for our example. $850,000 basis. Now, when you're doing straight line depreciation, you take a deduction, a small amount, every single year for 39 years. Even if you don't own the building for 39 years, you just get that deduction and have to take that every single year, okay? Which means a tax deduction means you have income from your property. Let's say your property that you bought for a million dollars is giving you a net operating income, an NOI of $50,000. That's pretty good, not bad, 5% return. $50,000 straight away, you take $21,794. If it's a commercial building, okay, retail, office, self-storage, uh, you name it, and you only pay tax on the remaining 29 or 28 and change. If it's a residential building, multifamily, you take off $30,909 every single year, and you're left with, on that $50,000 income, you deduct 30 right off the top, you're left with only 20,000 that you actually have to pay tax on. Now what cost segregation does is we create in the first five years usually much larger deductions and we're front loading those um, deductions so that we can have tax free income for the early years of ownership. And we're taking time, we're taking hold of the property of the of the actual benefits from the property. So some fundamentals of how this actually works. One of the principles is, and I'm actually going to go later on into the actual details of the from the conservation audit techniques guide, which is you know put out publication by the IRS how it has to work. And one of the things is you have to have a qualified engineer actually come to the property, walk the property, inspect the entire thing. Then he's going to reclassify real property expenditures, meaning he's going to find the building which depreciates. The structural is really the only thing that depreciates on that 27 and a half year schedule or 39. And we're going to break out. We're going to say, oh, there's personal property assets that depreciate on a five year schedule. And we're going to show you in the next couple of slides what some of those are. And we're going to find land improvements that depreciate on a 15 year schedule. We're going to find things in the property that actually have a shorter life. And we're going to get those deductions earlier on. And what this is going to do is going to produce huge non-cash tax deductions, meaning we're not going to get a refund on this, on this money, but what we are going to do is going to have the income produced from the property, and in many cases, even income produced outside the property, meaning even your active income, if you're a real estate professional, which we will touch on later as well, you can actually use these deductions to offset your income, meaning pay less taxes. Um, so these are some, just some history. This is, goes back, cost segregation goes back to about 40 years or so, uh, close to 50 years even, when it first came about. And there have been many court cases along the way, which have kind of defined and shaped the industry and shaped how it works in the tax code, what type of property, you know, is considered personal property that depreciates on a five-year schedule. It used to be just like movable objects. And then, you know, certain court cases said, well, what about, you know, floor tiling or, or carpeting or wall coverings and fixtures and things like that, that can be movable, it's not part of the structure. And over time and time, many, many more things got included in that. So here's a great, this is actually an example from the case study that we're gonna do later on. This is a real list of the things that are found inside of a multifamily building that can be depreciated at a faster rate. And again, there are two main categories outside of the land, which doesn't depreciate, and the building, the structure, which is on that 27-year schedule. Five-year property, which is called personal or tangible property, and 15-year property, which is called land improvement. So think of the building, think of anything inside the property that's not actually structural. It's not structural. So main pipes, main electric, right, that's structural, the roof. Right, the foundations, the walls, all that is structural, and that has the main value of the property. However, a large amount is actually going to be, you know, signage. You have cable TV. You have shelving, no work, mirrors, carpeting, you name it. Um, you're going to have cabinetry in many cases, vinyl floors, window treatments, the, the blinds, curtains, etc. Furniture, equipment, all that stuff. And when you take the value of each and every one of those things and come up with how much it costs, and kind of do like a reverse engineering of the property, 
and see what is the replacement cost if I were to build it now. And that's exactly what the engineers were doing when they come back and build a study that shows you how all of this depreciates on a faster life. The second main category is called 15 year land improvements. So concrete, asphalt, right? Fencing, landscaping, you have a playground, a pool, all this stuff, retaining walls. And so when you look outside of a multifamily building, especially a garden style building, you have a parking lot, right? You have a curb, you have a sidewalk. All of those things have value to it. And you can actually take the value of that at a much faster rate as a tax deduction. Now, you, again, like I mentioned before, you need the engineering aspect of this because you can't figure this out on your own, right? You can't just throw a dart at the wall and figure like, hey, I think this stuff is cost X, Y, Z. Now, if you're doing a new construction and you are actually building a property from scratch, you have all of those items, you will have a very detailed report of, you know, uh, line items, invoices of what you spent and on what you spent. Now you can get an engineer, you know, some CPAs can have the experience and can do it on their own. But in most cases, you still need the engineer to come down to the property at that point and match up what was spent versus what was actually built and what fits into which category. And so it can be very valuable for new construction as well. But for a new, uh, a new acquisition from an old property, let's say this property was built. And I, I want to even say something really important over here. I mentioned at the beginning that depreciation is like a, a borrowed term, but really the whole thing is like a hypothetical concept. Okay, think about this for a second. Depreciation starts, meaning this tax deduction that you get when you buy a property starts, this 27 year schedule starts the day that you buy a property, okay? When you place it in service. Now the property could have been built in 1927 but it starts over and has a new useful life when you buy it in 2019, okay? Which means you can write off the entire amount that was spent on that property over the next 27 and a half years. Now, what happens when you go and sell that in five years from now to someone else? They take the amount that they purchased it for and they get to write that amount off over the next 27 years. It starts over. So it doesn't really have to do with the intrinsic value of the property and when it was actually built. Okay, so this is a really important concept to understand that it's really, in many cases, very hypothetical. Okay, so these are the main asset classes. These are main examples of what fits into those asset classes. So again, just to review, um, cost segregation, what is it? We are, in, in essence, what we're doing is it's the time value of money. We are creating more deductions earlier on, right? We're front loading tax deductions. And many times I'm going to show you a chart soon of how much that is per property, but usually, you know, somewhere between 20 and 30% for multifamily properties. We're front loading that and taking those deductions earlier on, and we're getting income, which is tax free, which is your cash flow, which means you can now use that money to reinvest. And that's called the time value of money. And now I want to just before we get into what bonus depreciation is. I want to just explain something very important, okay? And I've said this, I've said it before, I'll say it again. It's so important. You have no obligation to pay taxes, okay? I want you to hear that. And I want you to understand what I mean by that. There is no rule that you have to pay income tax. The only rule is that if you have a tax liability, then you have to pay tax. But if you have income and you have deductions, right, that are legitimate legal deductions, like depreciation, if you own rental properties, you can now take those deductions and wipe out your entire income, meaning that all the money that you make is tax free, okay, so you have no obligation, again, to pay taxes. Um, we will definitely touch on bonus depreciation, and I see that um, someone asked in the, in the note over here, uh, recapture tax. We're going to get into that soon as well. So let's talk. Let's just jump right into who's going to benefit from this. Who should be doing this? So anyone who's paying taxes, anyone who's tax liable. So if it's a nonprofit or it's a government entity, they don't pay tax. They can't do it. But if you're an individual state, it doesn't matter what type of entity actually owns it. Because in many cases, uh, especially with an LLC, it's just a pass through entity, which means that if you have, you know, five partners in an LLC, and each one owns 20% of the equity of the property. Let's just keep it very simple and joint venture. 
then each one of them is going to get 20% of the income. They're going to get 20% of the depreciation. Okay, it just passes right through. So if you're doing cost irrigation, you're going to increase that. Each one is going to get more according to their percentage of ownership. It gets a little more complicated when you're looking at limited partners versus general partners, how much equity stake you have. But according to your percentage of ownership, whatever that is, you get your percentage um, given to you that way. I will say something very important, which I see there's some people who are syndicators on this call and recognize some names. There are several ways to actually set up a uh, operating agreement. Now, the most common way is to do an LLC in which people are limited partners, general partners, and therefore have an equity stake in the property. There is, however, and I will you know, say this, it's important to speak to an attorney to get this straight, but there are ways to structure the ownership that some people in the ownership of the property who are investing in it in the syndication have actual uh, benefit from the depreciation and others who don't, right? Usually, if you, if you just set a, a, a regular operating agreement, a normal way of ownership, then everyone shares equity, everyone shares depreciation. You can't allocate and say, hey, I want all the depreciation and you're not gonna get any, but there is a way to structure the operating agreement in such a way that uh, there is a difference of who gets paid, how they get paid, if it's based on equity, if it's based on If you, let's say, have someone who's investing in the property, they cannot benefit from the depreciation. For example, let's say they're investing from a 401k, okay, which now, nowadays um, they call it QRP, which is the same exact thing, right? It's just a fancy marketing term uh, that someone made up, okay? Uh, 401ks or Roth IRA, it's tax-free money. Tax-free money, you cannot benefit from the depreciation. Okay, so if you have investors that are coming from that, it might be worthwhile looking into how to structure that entity so that the people that can benefit from the depreciation will get it. And instead of just giving the depreciation to these people that they won't benefit from it at all, you can actually utilize it in a much more um, savvy way. Okay, um, this is a really, really, really important topic. This is called a real estate professional. What is a real estate professional? And the reason why we're talking about that here is because it's really going to define, determine who is going to benefit most from depreciation from these tax deductions. Now, this page is taken directly from an IRS publication, which means this is tax law. Okay, this is, I just made it a little fancy over here, but you or your spouse qualify as a real estate professional. I mean, I should say you qualify as a real estate professional status. If either you or your spouse, one of you has to do it, meet both of the following requirements. Number one, you have to spend more than half your time, more than 50% of your time in that year doing real estate activities. Okay, real estate business, you have to be materially participating in that real estate activity, not just investing passively, you actually have to be materially participating and it has to be more than 750 hours a year. That's pretty easy to do, 16 hours a week or three months out of the year, you can spend the rest of the time on the beach, do whatever you want. But you have to be materially participating. What's called materially participating, if you're developing, redeveloping, constructing, reconstructing, acquiring, okay? And acquiring can actually involve a lot of steps on acquiring. Underwriting could you know, be involved in that, looking at properties, traveling to properties, the time spent doing that, okay? Converting it, renting, leasing, Operating, managing, brokering, all these things. If you are a broker you are pre and you own properties, you're managing them, you are pretty much a real estate professional. That means you get this fancy tax status. So why is it important to know what a real estate professional is? Because it's so important, okay? Uh, before we even get to that, okay, I'm going to go back to that. Real estate professional, okay? I spoke about beginning at the beginning over here that depreciation is considered a tax write-off. It's a passive loss, it's passive deduction. Now the passive deduction of depreciation can be used to offset your passive income. Real estate income from rental properties is considered passive income. Passive income means that you can only use depreciation to offset, which is a passive deduction to offset passive income. Okay, is that clear? It's pretty, pretty straightforward. However, that's a normal person. If you're a real estate professional, by this status, according to these two qualifications, you or your spouse, again, if you're a high income earner, you should have your spouse become a real estate professional. 
just so you can get this and why you can now use depreciation and the extra depreciation that's going to come from cost irrigation and use it to offset all of your active income as well. Okay, so your W-2 income, your spouse's W-2 income as well. Okay, this is huge. This is really the person that's going to benefit from cost irrigation the most because once you have this, you basically will never pay taxes again, literally. I mean, it's, it's, it's just incredible, but it's true in many, many cases, okay? So if you, I will say there is one case where even if you're not a real estate professional, you can actually benefit as well. And that's when you have, you do not qualify as a real estate professional and your, your uh, modified adjusted gross income, that's called your Maggie, is less than $100,000, okay? If your income is less than $100,000, then you get to take up to $25,000 of that passive loss, meaning of that depreciation after it's offset the income from your properties and you have more of it left over, you can use that to offset your active income as well, okay? Once you reach $150,000, it totally phases out. I see I wrote phases with a Z over here. I don't know what I was thinking, but that's, that's um, most of you retire when I wrote this. Okay, so again, even if you're not a real estate professional, if you have an income that's less than $150,000 a year, you can still use some of those deductions to offset your active income as well, but up to $25,000 and that's it. Let's talk a little about the recent tax reform, the Tax Cut the Jobs Act. There are a few things that happened and the main thing that happened over here was called bonus depreciation, okay? Bonus depreciation. This is called, it used to be just for new construction properties. Now it's for used properties, meaning you can use this deduction, and we'll talk about exactly what that is, to uh, take advantage of it on properties that you buy. Them. Or not new construction. It used to be new construction, now it's for any type of property that you buy. Which means any property that has a useful life of less than 20 years, okay, you can now take 100% of that depreciation in the first year of ownership. Now let's just go back, backtrack for a second. We talked about the five-year property, personal property. We talked about 15-year property, land improvements. We're gonna front load approximately between 20 and 30% of that, maybe even more, for your multifamily property. And we're spreading that over five years. So in the first five years, we're getting a huge tax deductions. Okay, probably doubling or tripling what our normal depreciation would have been. In the, over the 15 years or the next 10 years after that, you're getting, getting more depreciation as well. However, with 100% bonus depreciation, you can take that entire amount that was accelerated and take that deduction in year number one, okay? Now, this is set to last until 2023, and then it's going to start to phase out uh, back to 80%, then back to 70%, and over you know the next course, the next five years until 2028, until it's totally phased out. And 100% bonus depreciation, any bonus depreciation will no longer apply. So just to clear up, bonus depreciation is not a different thing than cost irrigation. In fact, the only way you can take the bonus depreciation election is if you have a cost segregation study done. Because once you have it done, you're allocating the property into these proper categories of their lives. Um, and then you can choose. Should I take it all in year number one, right? If you have a huge tax income, and I'll give you a perfect example. We have a, a client out in California. He's, you know, the number one broker in his county. And he, uh, you know, buys property as well. He owns property with him and his family. They own property. And so he bought, he just found out about cost segregation this year. And he called me up and said, you, you got to tell me about this. How does this work? And we had discussion. And he said he just bought a property for four and a half million dollars. Okay, and he wants to see how much depreciation he can get from it because he's paying through the roof in taxes. He didn't know about this, and his accountant never told him about this. And he paid last year over $350,000 in taxes. Okay, it means he was making a good amount of money, <laughs> making over a million dollars in, in his real estate um, rentals and his commissions, you know, from his brokering. Now, paying $350,000 is like in taxes when you're <laughs> when you own property and you can take depreciation is literally like thievery, okay? Now, I'm not gonna you know, talk about it too much. I'm just gonna tell you that we did the cost irrigation on this property. We took the 100% bonus depreciation, over $1 million 
We're paying for four and a half million dollar property over one million dollars of depreciation that he took, which means that he not only knocked off his entire income tax liability, but he has now a passive loss that he's going to carry forward, which if he needs it next year, he can do that as well. Okay. But he had totally knocked off and paid instead of $350,000 of taxes, this year he's paying zero taxes. Okay. Um, it does not apply to 1031 exchange or non arms length transaction, which just means if you, you know, decide I'm going to, you know, change this into a different LLC, or I'm going to, you know, just sell this to my, my brother or my father or my sister, that's called a non arms length transaction. And the depreciation does not start over. Okay. It stays from when the original purchase date and price was, and you cannot take the bonus depreciation on that. Also, it does not apply if it's uh, bought and sold in the same year. Okay, so another important point. Um, I see there are some questions. We're going to get to them. I think at the end, we're pretty much you know we're moving right along. So I think we're doing pretty good on time here. Um, okay, when should we be doing this? So the best time people do this is right after the acquisition of the property. You want to get this, take advantage of it in the first year. But the next time you can, and, and the truth is, we do a free feasibility analysis of any property. So you, a lot of people reach out to me even before they buy it, when they go under contract, because they want to see what are their tax benefits going to be, how can they benefit their investors. And so we'll run those numbers, you know, just as a service so you can see what those tax benefits are going to be. You can do it after a renovation or a major addition, which means that you're spending, you know, bought a million dollar property. Will you spend another million dollars on that property to renovate it? Okay, you're not going to spend that much, but let's just give an example. That entire million dollars is now added to the basis added to the books, which means you now have to depreciate that. But you can do a cost segregation study on the renovation aspect of it and take the bonus depreciation, take the extra tax deductions earlier on, so you're going to spend that money. And this is the amazing thing. Again, the basis, okay, the depreciation amount has to do with what? The purchase price of the property, regardless of the fact of how much you actually paid. Okay, if you paid 20% down payment and the bank paid the rest, you still get the tax deduction on the entire amount that was spent, okay? Now, if you did seller financing, okay, and you paid zero, let's say, you still get that tax deduction as if you paid the entire amount that the property was purchased for. We're getting, another best thing about cost irrigation is that you can actually do it retroactively. You can do what's called a look back study a property that's purchased in a previous tax year, and you didn't even know about this, okay? You were doing straight line depreciation. We can do, excuse me, one second, catch up depreciation. We can literally, it's similar to bonus depreciation in the fact that, let's say you bought a property five years ago, all that five-year property, you should have taken the tax deduction already. However, what ended up happening? You were taking straight line. You're staying a little bit every single year. You can now do a catch up deduction retroactively and take all of that amount in the next year. So it's similar to bonus depreciation in that effect when you're going retroactively. You do not need to amend any tax returns to do this. You file a form called 3115. It is a little complicated, which is why we do it as a service at no extra charge for our clients because it's something we do all day long every day. So, but it, you'll probably take a regular accountant who's not familiar with it about you know six to eight hours to complete this uh, tax form, okay? But that allows you to now change your depreciation method and go and do it. So here are some, you know, just to give you some numbers of how much is actually reclassified. Okay, how much is reallocated into these faster lives? The five-year personal property, the 15-year property. So you see apartment buildings, you know, we're talking about, oh, I just skipped that. Apartments are talking approximately between 25 and 30 percent are reclassified. Okay, sometimes even up to 35 percent, but this is the average. Um, auto dealerships, grocery stores, every type of property can really benefit from this. Okay, and you see some of the big ones, research laboratories, because there's so much equipment, there's so much, you know, and also what it fits into that, a lot of equipment is what? Is nursing homes, okay, assisted living facilities. These kind of things have a lot of equipment. It's also up to close to 40%. Mobile home parks is probably one of the biggest that's out there. Those in golf courses, because we're talking about the 15 year property, land improvements, literally can be up to 50, up to 80% of steam on mobile home parks and golf courses, literally an 80% allocation, reallocation into that 15 year property. So if you're looking for huge tax deductions, go buy a golf course. I'm serious. I'm, I'm just going to keep saying this until you know more people listen to me. If you want to get the best tax deduction for your buck, 
you buy a million dollar property, you can go ahead that year take bonus depreciation up to eight hundred thousand dollar deduction. Okay, tax deduction. Okay? And I'm not telling you those are the exact numbers, but but it can be up to that amount. Hey, Yona, is that why our president buys golf courses? Well, that's why he buys everything. <laughs> because, but yeah, absolutely, for sure. That's 100% why he buys golf courses. You know, it's for this very reason. Very few people know this. And it's the best type of asset. I literally had this conversation with, with our CEO today. He's like, you know, he's like, keep telling people to buy golf courses. <laughs> he's like, it's the best thing. And I, I just keep saying it over and over until, uh, until more people do it. Okay, so now let's do a quick case study. And this is pretty much we're coming to a, a close after we do this case study. So I see there are a bunch of questions and I'm very happy to get to them as soon as we finish here. So this is a uh, multi-family property. This is actually in North Carolina, 1.75 million, 32 unit garden style. You can see the pictures here, very nice. Pavement, nothing new, okay? Nothing new over here. This was like a 1980s build. And you know, it looks like the pavement has, is from the 1980s as well. Nevertheless, um, without cost irrigation, the depreciation would have been on this property 54,000 and change every single year, which means from his net operating income, which was close to $100,000 um, on this property after he you know, got things in place, he was getting already about half of that um, deducted. So he's only paying taxes on the remaining 50,000. Not bad, okay? But with cost irrigation, what do we do? We blew it out of the water. How do we do that? We allocate 15% for land, okay, so 262500 does not depreciate. The remaining, okay, the 27 and a half year property, 72%, okay, that's the structural components, okay, you're talking about, you know, the walls, the roof, main plumbing, main stuff like that. Then we allocated, and you're allocated 8%, so 15 year property, again, that's the landscaping, the pavement, the, um, you know, the signage that there was in this property, the fencing. $122,000, okay? Five-year property, that's the personal property, all the carpeting, all that stuff that we talked about way at the beginning. I'll just slide back to that slide over here so you can see it again. Where is it? Um, yeah, all this stuff, okay? Shelving, lighting, millwork, right? Mirrors, carpeting, equipment and furniture, vinyl flooring, all that stuff. 20% of the basis, okay? That's incredible. 200, close to $300,000. So he's walking away with bonus depreciation of $421,000. Okay, so that's what he did. He basically took 100% bonus depreciation because in his case, yes, he had $50,000 of um, you know, remaining income, so why take an extra $400,000, an extra $370,000? What are you gonna do with it? It doesn't benefit you. It's just going as a passive loss. The truth is he actually had capital gains tax as well from the failed 1031 that he did, and he would have been paying $300,000 in taxes on that, um, or close to the future then. So he took the extra $300,000 of bonus depreciation, was able to offset not only his income, but after all his income and his wife's income, also offset the gains from uh, that failed 1031. So it's an incredible uh, way to really utilize your tax benefits. Uh, this is the principles, if anyone wants to look at this, on the check out the cost of audit techniques guide. You can go to Google that, the IRS website. These are the methodologies that have to be used to do this, produce a study, which ends up being, you know, in our case, between 80 and 100 pages long. It's very detailed. Um, what do you need to know when you're selecting a conservation company? And this is something really important, okay? I'm not here to sell you on a company, okay, Madison Specs, we're going to be one of the largest, if not the largest national companies out there. And there are a handful of others as well. And I'm sure every single one of them has all of these components, in it, which is they have engineers and tax accountants in-house. They're not outsourcing anything. They're doing it all in-house and they're doing engineering approach, which the IRS requires to do. Um, you're making sure they're giving you a true assessment. They're giving you um, an upfront analysis even before you engage with them so that you can see you know, what your numbers are going to look like, if it's going to be worth it or not. And then they're going to have 100%, you know, audit defense, which means not only they they claim to have audit defense, they actually have experience in doing that, and that should go without saying. At no extra cost, they should stand behind their work, um, which we do. And in any case that any of our clients have been audited in the past 15 years, it's come back 100% no change. And the only reason why that is, you should know, is because 
pasture irrigation, if done properly, does not raise any red flags, does not raise an audit whatsoever. But if a person is audited, they're going to look at it. They're going to look at the study. It has to hold up. It has to follow all these principles. Otherwise, you're going to be stuck. Um, and not just stuck, you may be fined. <laughs> so, so not a good idea. Okay, and that pretty much, um, you know, this is what uh, can lead to some of the beginning, 50 you know, in-house people, a lot of experience, and it speaks for itself. Okay, it's Madison, people know Madison title from Texas especially, and um, yeah, happy to now get to the questions, and I'll share my contact information over here if anyone wants to, to go out. So let's just go um, one by one. I see there are questions both in the Q&A box and in the chat box, okay? Yeah. We can start with the Q&A box, I think. Um, so Madhavi asks, uh, what percentage of bonus depreciation cost seg needs to be recaptured and how to effectively avoid it? Is TIC or tenancy in common the only way? Which is very complicated. Right, so if you are, the tenancy in common is a way to, you're discussing doing a 1031 exchange, that's the you know, real only way to do that out of a partnership is if you're doing a tenants in common or buying a property with tenants in common, which means, uh, but really a question is a great question because what is recapture tax? Recapture tax means that when you sell a property, you have to pay a tax on the amount of depreciation that was taken. Okay? Now this can be avoided. The way that this can be avoided is really twofold. Number one, it can be avoided and because we don't want to pay tax. We don't want to tax now. We don't want to pay tax when we sell a property. So the two ways to avoid uh, recapture tax is if you do a 1031 exchange, okay? And if you're in a partnership, it's a little bit complicated, but it can be done. The other way to do it is what a lot of people use this strategy, which is called partial asset disposition. Partial asset disposition means the following. When we are allocating, uh, you know, cost to those five-year assets, to the personal property, and we're saying, hey, this air conditioning unit, um, you know, this, these uh, furniture, these cabinets depreciate over five years, okay? Their value is what? When I bought the property, value is $10,000, okay? Now I go ahead and sell the property five years later. Guess what? From a tax perspective, that air conditioning, those, that furniture, those cabinets no longer have value to them from a tax perspective. And so from a tax perspective, Upon sale, you can file a form when you sell a property, which is called a partial asset disposition, and you can actually allocate a lesser amount to those personal property items. And I'm not talking about putting personal property in the sales agreement. That's not what I'm talking about at all. You may have seen that before. It's not necessarily something you should do. Or, uh, but doing it on your tax form basically says these cabinets that were paid $10,000 for now, five years later, they're only worth $100. Now what? I'm only paying the recapture tax, which is 25%, on the $100 and not on the $10,000. Okay, does that make sense? Yep. And the other way to do it is if you have a lot of properties, because guess what, and you're a real estate professional, because guess what? When you have so much losses from your other cost irrigation on the other properties, if Okay, there's a hierarchy, but check out this hierarchy. You have, let's say you have a million dollars in deductions and you only have $100,000 in income for your property. You knock off that, you're left with a $900,000 loss. But what happens, you now have a sell another property and have capital gains tax, have depreciation recapture tax. If you have extra losses and you're a real estate professional, you can use those losses to offset the gain and to even offset the depreciation recapture tax from other properties. So you can literally get around it, you know, almost, almost all the time. Um, for passive investors who are not real estate professionals, they're probably not going to be able to benefit from that um, as much, unless you're doing the partial asset disposition, so it's gonna knock that down a lot. Okay, I think we answered okay. so uh, one, uh, question. One comment here, um, I, we have a CPA on our call today, Manjiri, and okay. he commented on this, um, uh, cure the real estate professional status to meet materially participating for each of your real estate activities. Uh, you need to make an aggregation grouping election. So you meet, okay, I'll let her clarify. She's on the call. Okay. Hey, uh, hey, hey guys. Welcome. Hey guys. Um, 
So yeah, so just to clarify, and I know this is getting into the technical details, but uh, so to meet the real estate professional you know, test, it's a two prong test, right? So you need the 750 hour requirement mm -hmm you know, on all your real estate activities, you know, whether you're a broker, whether you're a construction developer, you know, whatever, real estate agent. But the other big piece of that test is that you need to be materially participating in each right. of your real estate, rental real estate activities. Now, let's say, for example, you know, all you have is rental real estate. You need to be materially participating in each of your rental real estate. And so the whole material participation, it's another five prong test, but one of the basic requirements of material participation is that you have to have 500 hours. Um, so technically you're not going to be materially participating 500 hours in each of your rental real estate activity, correct? So what you do is you have to make a grouping election so that you group all your real estate activities together, your rental real estate activities together and say that when I combine those five rental real estate activities together, then yes, I meet you know, the material participation standard on this combined group. And then you go to the 750 hour test, like do you have the 750 hours on a total re real estate activity? Then you meet both the test and then you qualify as a real estate professional. So just, you know, having one, you know, you can meet that materially participation standard for, you know, in an ideal world, you won't be able to meet that standard for each of your rental real estate activity. So make sure that you keep that in mind that you will have to do a grouping election or aggregation election to combine all of your rental real estate activities um, so that you meet the materially participation, material participation standard on that group as a whole. And obviously if you're into this real estate you know, business, then you are gonna have the 750 hours you know, uh, mm -hmm. already met. Uh, but mm -hmm. the other thing is also just keep in mind that when it comes to the grouping, you have to make sure that you can, so you can combine your, your real estate like your if you're a real estate agent, you can combine that with your rental. So you can only combine the like, the like similar businesses together. So you can only combine the rental real estate activities together and you can only combine all your construction, you know, your developing activities together. So make sure that you have all those, you know, uh, details when you go about, you know, thinking of becoming a real estate professional. Right. Thank okay. you for the Thank clarification. You. Yeah, that was incredible. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, excellent. Right. And also one other thing on this whole cost sex study. So our approach always, you know, um, as you know, as a firm, like we have a lot of real estate clients. Our approach has always been cost sex studies. Yes, you know, definitely all the, you know, advantages, all that you and I talked about, they're all advantages, you know, you get the bonus depreciation, write-offs, accelerated depreciation, whatnot. But it almost makes sense if you have long-term goals for that property. Uh, right. Like somebody mentioned over your depreciation recapture. So obviously if the goal is you're gonna be, you know, this is going to be a short-term turnaround, you know, quick turnaround, one or two years and you're gonna get out of it, then it doesn't make sense because you're gonna end up recapturing all the depreciation as ordinary income. Right. So as long as you have long-term goals for that property, you're gonna, you know, hold that property for five, six, seven years down the line, then, you know, yes, go ahead and, you know, uh, make that investment because the cost sex studies themselves are not that cheap. So, you know, obviously you have to uh, go through the whole study and whatnot, and then you get to write off that depreciation, you know, the five, the seven and the 15 year. And then, then you will start seeing at the, if, if basically if it's a long-term investment, then you will see the benefits out of a cost. So I have study. a question on that for both of you. So right. God, could you not um, offset the depreciation, uh, offset the recapture again with another property that you'll be investing into and repeat the process, sort of rinse and repeat? So let's say I buy a property, my first property, and then do a cost sex study and depreciation and claim that depreciation the first year. Two years later, I sell my property. I have to recapture, but then I invest it into something else. Whether I do a 1031 exchange or not, I get the depreciation again, and now I'm able to offset the recapture. So why wouldn't you do that? But the recapture, you're, you're, you're picking up the recapture at ordinary income rates. That's the piece, right? So you're paying the recapture of the, de the depreciation that's recaptured is at ordinary income tax rates. And then whether you do a 1031 or an opportunity zone investment, depending on what you do. Um, no, I'm yes, talking you about a new, new depreciation on the new property that I invest into. So I have depreciation again on the new property that I'm investing into. So technically that depreciation can offset the recapture. 
Yes, yes. I mean, if you're invest, yeah, if you're reinvesting it, yes, Correct. it can. But this is for you know for somebody who's just looking to cash out. Um, Correct. Yeah, because uh, we generally end up reinvesting and moving into different properties. So it might be okay for us to do the cost sex study and still right. get the depreciation. And then at the recapture, the same year, we do another depreciation on the new property. Right. And by, and by reinvesting, you mean you're, you're doing a 1031 like-kind exchange, correct? Not necessarily. Let's say I pull the cash out, I sell it, and I go in the same tax year, buy another property and do another cost sex study, and I get a depreciation again. Now, technically, the first, uh, the recapture can be offset with the depreciation the second time, right? I mean, yeah, you're just, you still get to write off that depreciation, obviously, as an ordinary, you know, deduction, assuming, you know, you're whatever, yeah. they're not and that'll offset professional the... and everything. Um, right. So that's always, yeah, that's always going to be there, but it's just that, you know, uh, and that's again, yeah, you'll get the ordinary deduction at the ordinary income tax rates. But uh, yeah, if you're not buying anything, if you're not turning around and buying right. anything immediately, then you have that, you know, tax right. out of your pocket at the, exactly. at the first right. sale. Yeah. Right. right. So okay. I always like to say also, like, you know, if you're buying one property and like that's your goal and, you know, conservation may not be for you. Okay. If, if your long term goal may be just to, you know, even if you're just buying one property, even if it's a long-term goal, you may have the tax benefits at the beginning, but generally speaking, it might actually be advantageous to keep it, um, you know, equal and have it more kind of balanced depreciation over the course. But when you're, you know, people who are planning on scaling, they're trying to buy a lot of properties, they're trying to use however much money they can from their income to then, you know, buy more and continue buying more. So basically the deductions are gonna just be rolling over onto themselves and just continually growing that. Yeah, and, and um, Kavita, I just read somebody says something yeah. about the 25%. Yes, so the depreciation on the building, that's the 25%, but you know, if you have the five or the seven, that is gonna be recaptured at whatever your ordinary income tax rates are, assuming they're not all, you know, completely depreciated and whatnot. And, but the, the, the the building piece, you know, that depreciation recapture is a 25%. It's a special, it's a special tax rate called the unrecapped depreciation. So that's at 25%. Gotcha. What is the typical cost of a cost seg for a 10 unit million dollar building? This question is probably Yona. Yeah. So, I mean, I know um, Mandri mentioned that obviously study costs money to do. And so that's always going to be a factor. Well, what's the tax benefit going to be? And my rule of thumb is usually over a million dollars uh, purchase, you're going to see you know, tremendous benefit. And the cost of it, you know, we base our costs based on the scope of work that's involved. So nothing to do with the actual um, you know, tax benefits that are there. So even if it's a million dollar purchase or it's a $10 million purchase, the cost is pretty much going to be the same. So on multifamily properties, for example, um, the scope of work is a lot less than other type of properties. It's usually somewhere between four and six thousand dollars. That's pretty much our rate, which is pretty competitive out there. I know a lot of firms are charging double or triple that, uh, but because we have that, you know, huge volume and we're doing so much, and we have that, you know, whole in-house team doing this, cut down a lot of costs uh, in doing that. So yeah, so that's. That's then we'll, we will always give a quote upfront, not only on the estimation of what your tax benefits would be, but also what the, you know, what the one-time fee would be. So yeah, we are a national company, we work in all 50 states, and uh, you guys from Texas probably know us as the title guys, Madison Title, but we are also, uh, Specs is, is probably the largest, if, you know, one of the top five, if not the largest uh, cost in the country. Okay. This one's an interesting question because uh, I actually, I have it too. Um, so if you perform a cost segregation study at acquisition, does it require a whole new study after a future renovation or property expansion? Or is there a supplemental type adjustment? So what happened is we bought a property and we're buying a property that we had a fire before closing. We actually lost 13 units in the property. Mm -hmm. So we are actually rebuilding those 13 units. So we, if we do a cost sex study in the year that we bought it, which will be this year, should we repeat our property, uh, a cost segregation study again, or is there any kind of like just a simple, hey, let's add this on. How do you do that? Like, what, what, what can we do? So in your case, a very interesting question, because in your example, there's a couple things that, that really 
kind of pop out at me. Now, in a normal case of renovation, um, there is like a supplemental study. It's not a full-blown cost segregation study, but it's a, called a renovation study, which means we'll look at the, you know, the actual money spent, the actual invoices, what was done, and we'll see what was added to the basis and what can be reallocated to those faster lives and what can be taken as that, um, you know, the bonus depreciation if, if you choose to. And, but that's just normal renovations. When you're talking about a case where you had a fire in the property, there's something else that comes up, which is, you know, if there was insurance claim on that, if there was insurance claim yeah. and the insurance gave, you know, for the replacement cost of that, so you may not actually be able to add that cost to the depreciable basis. Got it. Um, but, you know, you obviously want to figure out that all the details of that and should be discussed, uh, you know, with us or with your accountants to figure out what was spent, how much was spent, what was from the, what was from the claim and what can actually be uh, depreciated. Got it. Okay. So the next question is, are self-storage eligible for cost segregation? He, it wasn't in that list, so. Yes, absolutely. Oh, um, it's funny, why, you know, I only had so many things that I could put on the list. Cost segregation applies to anything and everything, every type of property. And I will say this, the only type of property it does not apply to is your personal residence, okay? So if you own a property that is an investment property or a business property, you can do cost segregation on it. Self storage is can have incredible benefit, not just from you know the storage unit. Obviously, in every property there's going to be different assets in there, right? So the list that I gave before about multifamily, there's not going to be you know countertops in the self storage. But there, what there will be in self storage units, and we do tons of in fact one of the largest um, self storage REITs in the country. You know, uh, we do all their all their work, and literally we've done you know, probably about I'd say 350 properties for them. Uh, over the past several years. And their climate control is a big thing. When you have climate control self-storage, that has a lot of value to it. And that's going to um, you know, be allocated to the five-year property. There are also a lot of 15-year property, the parking lots, et cetera, uh, which will be there. So yes, yeah, self-storage, excellent asset class. Um, yeah, go ahead. Um, what, who else? All right. Um... Question is, um, is the mar is mortgage related activity uh, eligible for as a qualified real estate professional activity? No, no. Okay. Manjuri? Yes, ma'am. Sorry. So uh, if you are a mortgage broker, do, is yeah. that qualified as a real estate activity? Uh, I don't think so. No. Okay. No. So the answer is no. Okay. Uh, who do, who needs to do cost sag and who doesn't need to? That's a pretty general question. So it is a pretty general question, but I guess the real question is, and this is why we provide the upfront estimate, is it's going to be a really subjective question. Who need who should do it and who shouldn't do it? If you need the extra deductions, that's going to be the answer. So it's a really personal question. You know, what's your tax situation? You know, not just the income from the property, but, you know, in your individual situation. And I had a great conversation today with, with um, three guys, and I'll just give you a great example. The three of them, they were, uh, you know, each one of them had a totally different perspective. And they were partners on a property, a small, relatively small property. Um, and one of them really wanted to do the cost renovation. He, he could definitely use the deduction. None of them were real estate professionals, actually, which was really interesting. Um, one of them could totally use it. The second one was totally against it because he's like, I can't benefit from this at all. And the third one was like, hey, I could actually use some of the passive losses. I don't know if the cost is going to justify it. I don't know what the benefits going to be. So they were like all on the fence. Like each one of them had a totally different reason. But at the end of the day, the question is, looking at your situation, you're going to see what, um, what your depreciation would look like if you did the conservation over the next you know, 20 years, what that would look like. Okay, great. There was another question that I answered, but someone asked if you would do a cost, um, cost seg for a single family home. And I think my answer was, if you have a really expensive home, maybe you're in California, it costs a million dollar plus home. I know a friend of mine did that for a $1.5 million home he owned in California. Yona, mm -hmm. do you want to speak to that? Sure. Um, you know, my, like I said, my rule of thumb is like over a million dollars. It's like, there's tremendous benefit there. And especially when we're talking the cost 
um, minimal cost is going to be like somewhere around, you know, for our, what we do, our work, you know, somewhere between three and a half to four thousand dollars minimum for just any type of property. You just that's the amount of work that's involved. Just single families, if it's under a half a million, it, it really is not going to make so much sense. You know, the tax benefit does not totally outweigh, um, you know, what what the cost is going to be. And sure, your tax benefit still may be, you know, twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars. Is that going to be worth it? That's a question, you know, for your, for yourself to look at. I don't push it because I don't think it's worth it. However, um, there are, and I will say this because I'm not, you know, a proponent of this, but you know, people should be aware that there are some companies out there that have developed some sort of softwares uh, that do this at a, at a fraction of the cost. Now, we don't do this because uh, it's not recognized by the IRS. So it's kind of like a loophole and people are doing it. It's a little bit risky, but uh, you, you should be aware if someone has smaller properties and they, they want to try to get some sort of calculations in there, all it's doing is just punching out calculations. You don't have a report, you don't have anything like that, but I know some people are doing it on smaller single families. Um, so it's just to put that out there. Cool. So I would just add to that. So I have never seen it on a residential property as such, you know, even if it's to the tune of 1 million. And, um, and even if the client's aggressive, um, the onus is always gonna be on the taxpayer, you know? Mm -hmm. um, to provide to their CPA or whoever it is, so if they're self-filing. But you know, it's always going to be the burden of proof is always going to be on the taxpayer to prove as to how they came up with the segregation. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, I have never seen it on a. Or I have yeah, up until I now. I've not seen it on a residential. Yeah, we've done we've done you know plenty of them, especially you know vacation rentals, uh, especially like Kavita said when they're when they're luxury rentals. There can be a lot of very expensive uh, furniture furnishings in there. It can actually be very worthwhile. Yeah. Yeah, and the California homes, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the other questions, um, if one has, okay. Uh, da, da, da. Okay. If one has several single family residential for short term rental that are furnished, they don't meet your cost seg minimum. So can that property owner perform their own study or hire an engineer for those? I'm not sure I completely understand. I Yuna. That. Yeah, I think we just answered that in the previous okay. uh, that. Okay. answer. So yeah, I mean, really the only real way to do it is to hire for hire, do the engineering way. But again, like I said, there are like, like uh, Mandri said, this is on, on you, the time to make sure you know, on risk on the show. Can you do it on your own? Can you just punch in numbers? You can do anything, but you have to really have the proof and, you know, it's not going to be passed in the event of an audit. So that's really what it comes down to. Yeah. Okay. Last question. I think we'll wrap up after this. How is the building development cost calculated? Uh, is it the cost that you buy it at a plus rehab cost versus a rent-based appreciated value or the county appraised value? So it totally goes on the cost that we'll spend. Okay, and there are some of the hard cost, uh, the soft costs as well that can be depreciated. Um, so, but yeah, has nothing to do with appraised value, has nothing to do with uh, rent based appreciated value. And that applies not only to a development, but also to an acquisition. If you buy something highly discounted, you know, the building's worth $10 million, but you, you bought it, you know, for, for $2 million. Your depreciation basis is going to be based off of the purchase price, not on the value. And it doesn't change. And I get the question a lot. Well, what happens, you know, goes up in value. I go in and refi it. And now it's appraised uh, for twice what I bought it for. That does not change uh, the basis. The basis, <clears throat> excuse me, is, a, is established upon uh, acquisition or development, placed in service. There was another question about uh, title being held. I answered that. I think you covered that in your uh, presentation already. If you uh, just change title, yeah, that doesn't change the, the, the basis. Yeah. Okay. I think we are done. We are at 8.45. Thank you so much, uh, Manjuri. Thank you so much, Yona, for the presentation and for answering all the questions very patiently. And thanks so much, everyone, for joining in. Um, that's it for today. Thank you. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Much. Bye. Thank you. Yep. Bye-bye.